Hi there, my name is Liam Hodgkinson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley and the International Computer Science Institute, working under Michael Mahoney. I'd like to talk about some of our recent work on examining the effects of multiplicative noise in stochastic optimization, particularly how multiplicative noise can result in heavy tailed stationary fluctuations and wide exploratory behavior. All right, so to start with, uh, I'd like to give, set the scene with a very general definition of what we mean by stochastic optimization. So it's really any process where we're minimizing an objective function, usually unconstrained, uh, via the simulation of random elements. And there's a common catchphrase that goes with stochastic optimization, so it's really the backbone of machine learning, and this is very true. Uh, stochastic optimization is really a key ingredient in the success of deep learning to date. And the usual suspects that you tend to see in deep learning, of course, the classic stochastic gradient descent, which have iterations of the following form for some uh, step size gamma and random uh, mini batches omega k at each iteration. But of course, there's also uh, developments and extensions upon the idea. Uh, we have the momentum optimizer, we have second order stochastic Newton methods, we have the app atom optimizer famously, and many, many others. And all of these have their particular strengths and weaknesses. And they're all based around, you know, classic co uh, convex optimization ideas and algorithms. But the stochastic component that arises from the random choices of mini batches uh, can allow them to work surprisingly well in unconstrained non-convex settings. And from the theoretician's perspective, this is really interesting. There's a significant theory practice disconnect here. And a lot of the ways that people will use uh, stochastic optimizers in practice is based around heuristics. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that stochastic optimizers exhibit essentially two different phases uh, of training. Early on, when the learning rate is large, we get this very rapid exploratory behavior across the landscape where it can jump between basins with relative ease. But as we decrease the learning rate, we transition into the later phases where the learning rate is small and we end up with a traversal that's very similar to how optimizers behave in convex optimization settings, where you approach the nearest uh, local optimum within the basin that you're currently with, uh, in. So we've borrowed some terminology here from uh, the study of genetic algorithms and Monte Carlo methods and refer to these phases as the exploration and exploitation phases, uh, respectively. Uh, and both of these really require a different kind of analysis because the behavior is so different. Uh, we think that the exploitation phase uh, is very well covered by sort of classical convex optimization theory arguments. However, the exploration phase uh, is still really kind of unknown how it operates. It's, it's still kind of uncertain um, what particular attributes will give a stochastic optimizer uh, the ability to explore well. Uh, and this is a bit unfortunate because we know that this exploration phase is especially critical you know, in deep learning where we have non-convex objectives and has a, a major impact on generalization performance. So this exploration phase is really what we want to study here. And we're going to take uh, a slightly unorthodox uh, distributional approach in order to do this. So we'll investigate how a stochastic optimizer explores a lost landscape by modeling as an optimizer as a random dynamical system, in particular as a discrete time Markov chain. And what we're going to do is we're going to fix all of the hyperparameters to specific values. So we're not going to consider annealing or step size schedules here. And we'll get a time homogeneous Markov chain. And in this case, we're really interested in looking at the large step size regimes. So we'll usually fix the step size. Uh, to be big so that we can take a look at that exploratory behavior. And in particular, what we'll look at are properties of the stationary distribution. As this will give us a good idea of, uh, of how capable the optimizer is in exploring the landscape. 
Now, there are similar kinds of analyses uh, out there in the literature. A lot of these rely on continuous time approximations, and we really have gone to efforts to try to avoid using these approximations as we feel they kind of complicate the discussion a little. So we're gonna to stick to uh, discrete time uh, analyses here. And our findings are that multiplicative noise uh, generally can result in heavy-tailed stationary behavior. Uh, and this is really interesting because we, we consider the tails of the stationary distribution to be a good indication of the capacity of the algorithm to explore. And of course, heavy tail uh, stationary behavior means that the algorithm should have very good exploration capacity. What we mean by heavy tails here, of course, is that the decay rate in the tails is slower uh, than exponential. Uh, in particular, one of the ones that we're really interested in uh, is when the distribution decays uh, as the tail decays as a power law, uh, which is usually of this form uh, where we call alpha here the tail exponent of the distribution. And heavy tails, um, uh, we feel are really significant uh, in deep learning. It's kind of a big... Um, motivation for this project in the initial phases were recent efforts that empirically tied the presence of strong heavy tails during training with good generalization performance. And we think that according to the story that uh, we developed here, that this kind of makes sense. Heavy tails can imply wider exploration um, and therefore we can expect that the stochastic optimizer has greater potential to reach higher quality uh, minima. And so this, so we're really interested in establishing uh, heavy tails for these stochastic optimizers. All right, so let's get stuck into the theory now. So to begin with, we're going to look at how we can uh, formulate stochastic optimizers as Markov chains. Um, and in order to do this, of course, we'll, we note that uh, in machine learning, we're typically trying to solve problems of the following general form. We're trying to minimize uh, some objective function f, which we consider to be an expectation of some loss function over a data set. Here we're allowing the data set to be potentially infinite, but the data set can also be finite, in which case this expectation uh, can of course just be an average and we can recover empirical risk minimization. Most of the stochastic optimizers will be based on some form of fixed point iteration and this is really because of course we can formulate uh, minimization in terms of solving a root finding problem in order to locate critical points and in order to solve such problems you know you'll uh, invoke some form of fixed point iteration. So we imagine that you've got some map psi such that the fixed points of this particular expectation in psi are minimizers of the function f. Then we know that this sequence of iterations of the following form will either diverge or converge to some minimizer w star. Now in practice, this expectation may be too expensive to compute. So you take some kind of uh, Monte Carlo approximation or some average uh, where we sample over the data uh, independently. Now here we're assuming that the process is um, time homogeneous, so we've got all the hyperparameters fixed, and that the data is being shuffled uh, at every epoch. Now of course we can simplify this, uh, instead of writing this average, we can just write this as a map psi uh, in terms of a random vector sampled from the data set. And this gives us a time homogeneous Markov chain uh, that we can work with. Yeah, in particular, we notice that we've constructed the sequence of iterated random functions of the following form, but since, of course, a lot of these stochastic optimizers are derived from a root finding problem, they are, in fact, often of, the fo of this form instead. And uh, this is commonly referred to as uh, Borovkov's uh, Markov chain uh, in the probabilistic literature. And formulating um, stochastic optimizers 
in this form is very useful uh, because there's quite a lot of literature out there on showing ergodicity of these particular chains. Uh, what that means is we've got very general conditions on establishing uh, when these processes will be bounded in probability, which of course is good because we don't want our optimizers to just explode off to infinity. Throughout the rest of this talk, we'll assume that whenever we consider one of these Markov chains, that it will be ergodic. All right, so that's sort of the abstract formulation. Let's look at something a little bit more concrete. So we can formulate minimatch SGD uh, in this kind of general setting through the map Psi, which is chosen like so, where here we have that each of the Xi are chosen uh, randomly from our data set for a mini batch of size n and step size gamma. But we don't have to limit ourselves uh, to assuming that the dimension of the Markov chain is, uh, the state space of the Markov chain is equivalent to the state space of the weights. We can add in uh, you know, extra um, auxiliary variables and, we, and through this we can recover momentum, which we find uh, we can put into this Markov chain form uh, like so. Now this may look different to sort of standard formulations of momentum, uh, but it's formulated like this to guarantee that it is a Markov chain. And indeed you can verify that uh, this particular choice of psi will allow you to recover uh, the standard formulation of momentum. But really you, you can do this for any stochastic optimization that you come across uh, in the deep learning literature. In fact, we claim that every iterative stochastic optimization algorithm that you can come across in ML, once you fix the hyperparameters can be written as a Markov chain in this way. So that includes Adam, second order methods, uh, you know, anyone you choose. And this is really because all of them are based upon fixed point iteration and will typically have a finite memory uh, in order to actually be uh, you know, efficient computationally. So now that we've seen how stochastic optimizers can be formulated as Markov chains in, in a very general kind of way, let's actually try and do some analysis with this. And we'll start with a very simple case uh, where we look at ridge regression with mini batch SGD. So this is least squares linear regression with L2 regularization according to some parameter of lambda greater than zero. And we can formulate the objective of this particular problem in the, form, uh, in the following way. We have it in terms of an expectation over random variables uh, X and Y, corresponding to the labels and inputs over the data set. And what happens when we apply uh, mini batch SGD to this particular objective um, as a time homogeneous Markov chain that we saw before, we end up getting the following. We have that the iterates MK of this mini batch SGD, when we vectorize them and form these WK here, we end up with a random linear recurrence relation of the following form, where we have this multiplicative factor uh, AK here and uh, an additive factor BK. So the key thing to observe here is that there is both additive and multiplicative noise uh, in this process. And this is interesting because a lot of people uh, typically assume away the presence of multiplicative noise when examining um, you know, stochastic optimizers. And this is usually done uh, for simplicity of analysis. So at least in this case, we're curious to see, you know, what, what kind of difference does it make when we don't have multiplicative noise versus when we do. And, you know, if, if you go back to sort of previous analyses, uh, you'll see that it's, it's very commonly found that these algorithm, uh, these models which do not have multiplicative noise, which form a kind of perturbed uh, gradient descent, will exhibit a light-tailed stationary distribution. And you can prove this in the discrete time setting as well. But actual SGD, in this particular case with uh, ridge regression, uh, behaves very differently, as it turns out. So if we assume that the distribution of the inputs X has unbounded support, so we're considering uh, an infinite data uh, setting here, but we can also uh, apply this to a finite data setting, uh, provided that the uh, support of the distribution of the inputs is again uh, sufficiently large. 
if that Markov chain for SGD is ergodic, in other words, it's you know, bounded in probability, which will tend to be the case in practice, then its stationary distribution is guaranteed to be heavy tailed. And in particular, we know that the stationary distribution will exhibit a power law for some uh, tail exponent alpha greater than zero. And this result really comes from sort of a uh, you know, very old kind of probability theory and implicit renewal theory. Uh, a lot of these arguments date back to Harry Keston uh, in the 50s. Um, that, and this is all due to the fact that we can write SGD in this particular case uh, as uh, a random linear recurrence relation. So this is very interesting. Uh, we find that the presence of multiplicative noise here is actually allowing SGD to exhibit heavy tailed fluctuations, which suggests uh, much wider exploratory behavior than perturbed gradient descent um, models would suggest. Now, this ridge regression setting has been covered uh, by another um, group in much, much greater detail using those uh, implicit renewal theory arguments. So I recommend uh, taking a look at what, what they've done as well. What we want to do now is we want to move beyond the linear case and we want to go as general as we possibly can. So the big question that we want to ask is, okay, can we prove the existence of heavy tails arising due to multiplicative noise uh, for, for other models and other stochastic optimizers? And the result that we have uh, is the following. So first of all, we'll assume that the distribution of the data uh, X is non-atomic and that there exist functions uh, little k psi and capital k psi and some point w star which we can think of perhaps as being sort of the global optimum if it, um, if it exists but it can be any point uh, such that as uh, w tends to infinity we get uh, this sort of by Lipschitz uh, condition going on. So what this essentially means is that uh, our map psi that is formulating our optimizer uh, is uh, both Lipschitz and strongly convex at infinity. But uh, it can, in, uh, in any bounded region, uh, it can be uh, non convex. So, for example, uh, with uh, SGD, for for instance, we can uh, get explicit expressions for what these uh, little k and capital K psi will be in terms of the loss function. So for a step size gamma, we have that little k psi and capital K psi are the limit and limb soup of the minimum uh, spectral value and the uh, maximum spectral value of the matrices uh, are formed like so. And so we can work with these guys. Um, and based on these, we find that we can get heavy tailed behavior uh, under the following conditions. If we assume that the expected value of the log of capital K psi, uh, remember that this depends on the data, uh, is less than zero. So in other words, the stochastic optimizer is contracting on average. And we have that uh, our little k psi can be greater than one with positive probability. In other words, the optimizer can move away from any uh, optimum uh, at any time with positive probability, which is a, a good sort of indication of exploratory behavior. Then in fact, we do get a heavy tailed, sta a heavy -tailed stationary distribution for this process. Uh, in, in particular, we can bound it between two power laws uh, of the following form. And so what this means here is that, yes, we found that for multiplicative noise uh, that arises due to local variance in, uh, in Lipschitz constants, we can, in fact, get heavy-tailed stationary behavior. Well, this is nice. Uh, but we'd like some estimates on, you know, what mu and nu look like. And while we don't get them explicitly, we can recover bounds uh, on what they are. 
by looking at the moments of little k and capital K. In particular, if we have some alpha such that the expectation of little k psi is equal to one, uh, raised to the power of alpha is equal to one, then we know that alpha is a lower bound for our, um, our lower uh, tail exponent. And if we have that the uh, beta moment of capital K psi is equal to one, then we know that beta is an upper bound on the upper tail exponent. And we can work with these. So from this, we can uh, be able to predict the dependence of these tail exponents and uh, the heaviness of the tails on individual factors of the uh, optimization algorithm. All right. So that concludes the theory portion. Uh, let's now look at some experiments uh, and see some consequences uh, of multiplicative noise and uh, heavy tails in practice. So we'll begin uh, with sort of a simple 1D experiment. So we'll look at a, a non-convex uh, objective, F here, and we're going to add in uh, multiplicative and additive noise like we saw in uh, ridge regression with some uh, step size gamma, of course. We're, go we're going to compare between three different types of noise. The first is a light additive noise, where our additive noise term is normally distributed with some variance. We're going to also consider a heavy tailed additive noise. Uh, there have been a few models uh, out there that have uh, considered this as well, and we'd like to compare this to our multiplicative noise setting. So one way we're doing that here is by assuming that the additive noise component uh, is T distributed. And we're going to consider, of course, the case where we now have uh, multiplicative and additive noise. So here we'll assume that the multiplicative factor is normally distributed with mean one, and we'll also have the, uh, the additive noise being light tailed uh, with some other variance. And to keep it sort of consistent, uh, in order for the sake of comparison, we'll assume that the expectation and variance of the proposal distribution here uh, is constant between the three optimizers. Uh, and what we find is the following. So we ran, so we have this uh, non-convex uh, objective here shown in black, and we ran uh, a million iterations of this kind of perturbed gradient descent with combinations of small, moderate, and strong noise in each of those three settings, light additive noise, heavy additive noise, and multiplicative noise. Here in red, we show the initial starting location for the optimizer. And we can obs immediately observe uh, a few interesting things. So first of all, uh, in the light, um, you know, light tailed additive noise setting, uh, as expected, when this step size is small, we get very good um, exploitative uh, behavior where we're able to uh, converge and settle down in a nearby optimum uh, quite readily. On the other hand, however, for larger step sizes, we find that this particular optimizer has trouble uh, to explore this non-convex landscape. And it's only with very, very large um, noise that, is, that it is able to reach uh, the lower, uh, wider basin. And at this point, uh, with this amount of noise, we kind of lose a lot of resolution uh, in the effective loss landscape. On the other hand, uh, the heavy-tailed additive noise exhibits kind of the opposite behavior. Um, even for moderate step sizes, it's able to explore uh, the landscape much better. However, it has the problem that for smaller step sizes, it has a rough time uh, actually settling down to a particular nearby optimum. However, the multiplicative noise setting actually seems to exhibit the best of both worlds. Notice that we have um, very sort of uh, wide exploratory behavior, much like the heavy tailed additive noise case, uh, even for moderate step sizes. Uh, for larger step sizes, it's really quite uh, capable at reaching towards a wider minimum. 
but also for smaller uh, step sizes, it has even better uh, uh, capacity uh, to reach and uh, remain around nearby local optima. So the key observation here is that with multiplicative noise, uh, we seem to be able to achieve the best of both worlds. Uh, we seem to be able to explore well for larger step sizes and also converge uh, and, and stay around uh, nearby optimum uh, for smaller step sizes. So now that we've seen how multiplicative noise can result in positive qualitative attributes for a stochastic optimizer, let's move back to the heavy tailed perspective. We know from the theory that multiplicative noise results in heavy tailed stationary behavior. So we'll take a look at the stationary distribution uh, for a particular example. What we're going to do is we're going to run SGD with a constant step size to train a two-layer neural network using L2 loss over the wine quality uh, data set from the UCI database. Now, instead of working with uh, iterates of the process itself, what we're going to look at are these fluctuations, which are the differences between two successive entries in the chain. Now we know that for SGD, of course, this is going to correspond essentially to uh, the gradient. And we're going to look at the norm of this object, which we know from the theory should be heavy tailed. And in fact, one can prove using the triangle inequality that the tail exponent of this, uh, these limiting fluctuations will be the same as the stationary distribution of the process itself. We'll plot a histogram of these fluctuations over a large number of iterations, and we'll use a maximum likelihood estimation techniques to estimate the tail exponent. So to begin with, uh, we're going to vary the step size and see how the tail of this stationary distribution will change. Uh, from the theory, of course, we predict that larger step sizes will result in heavier tails, and that's exactly what we see in practice. Um, we find that as the step size increases, uh, the tail of the stationary distribution um, you know, increases, it gets heavier, and that's reflected in the estimates of the tail exponents as well. Similarly, when we change uh, mini batch sizes, we predict that smaller batch sizes will result in heavier tails. Uh, this is very much connected to this uh, continuing work into uh, the relationship between mini batch sizes and, uh, and step size. Again, what we find is that smaller batch sizes result in heavier tails. And that's exactly what we see both in the density plots uh, and in the uh, estimated tail exponents. Now this next one's a bit trickier. Uh, now we'll look at the effect of adding more regularization. And from the theory, we uh, expect that adding more regularization will result in heavier tails. And what we find in practice is a bit of a more nuanced picture. It's not quite that simple, but generally speaking, we do find that as the uh, regularization parameter at least becomes very large, uh, the tail exponent for the stationary distribution does become uh, uh, quite small. And so we, we do encounter uh, heavier tails. And yeah, this is, this is a little bit uh, difficult to tell uh, from tail exponent uh, estimates, but this is generally what we find. Now, finally, and perhaps the most interesting one of all, we can also change the optimizer and investigate uh, the tail exponent in these particular cases as well. And from the theory, we predict that SGD and stochastic Newton will result in heavier tails and so stronger exploratory behavior than the adaptive uh, optimizers such as Adegrad and Adam. And generally speaking, this is exactly what we see in practice as well. This isn't really reflected very well in the estimates for the tail exponents, but when we visualize uh, the density plots of these distributions, we do indeed find that uh, SGD and stochastic Newton have much longer tails uh, than uh, what we find for the gradient norms of Adam and Adegrad. 
which does indeed suggest that SGD and uh, stochastic Newton can exhibit uh, much stronger uh, exploratory behavior. And likewise, that Edegrad and Adam uh, could perform much better in the, late, uh, in the later stages uh, if we really want to hone in on a very particular local optimum. And this has been observed uh, particularly in NLP, where it appears that the lost landscape uh, can benefit from uh, more adaptive optimizers such as Adam. All right, so in summary, what we found is that multiplicative noise, which hasn't really been explored very much in the ML literature to date, is actually a pretty critical element for understanding the performance of stochastic optimizers. Uh, from our theory, we've established that multiplicative noise can result in heavy-tailed stationary behavior, and therefore, uh, in the early stages of the optimization, can uh, lead to far-reaching and efficient uh, exploration of the lost landscape. Now, this work is still very preliminary. Um, so in future, what we'd like to do, uh, of course, is you know, consider whether we can go even more general than we already have. At the moment, we've assumed this kind of strong convexity assumption at infinity. Uh, we're wondering whether we can actually go even more general than that. Um, also, our estimates that we're using for the tail exponent are a bit loose. Um, in, in the theory at least. So what we'd like to do uh, for our, our theoretical bounds is to try and improve the precision there, uh, also by considering more specific models such as deep neural nets. And that way we can kind of establish or, or predict uh, the impact of depth on, um, on these heavy tails. And from there we can sort of imagine it, whether uh, deeper architectures can actually lead to stochastic optimizers that are more capable of exploring the lost landscape. And, and finally, uh, here we've looked primarily at tail behavior uh, in, for the stationary distribution, but we can also investigate pre-limiting behavior. Rather than looking at the stationary distribution, we can take a non-asymptotic approach. And here it seems, at least from the simulations, that instead of getting something that decays like a power law, we get something that looks a little bit more uh, log normal. Um, and so this is something that we'd like to be able to establish uh, in theory as well. All right, so thank you very much for listening.